So, good morning. Thank you for coming and welcome to this event on individual learning accounts in the 2020s. My name is Renato Sabadini and I'm the Chief Executive Officer of All Digital, a Brussels-based organization representing and advocating for more than 70 member organizations across Europe. A member organization, in turn, comprise and support more than 20,000 digital competence centers, ICT learning centers, adult education centers, and libraries across the continent. Every year, 13 and a half million children and adults use these centers to access the internet, learn the latest digital skills, and keep up to date with technology and community developments. To use the words of a study group of the European Economic and Social Committee when drafting an opinion on sustainable funding for lifelong learning and development of skills, most of our members and members' members are de facto community lifelong learning centers, which explains our members' interest in the topic discussed here today and why we welcomed the explicit mention of individual learning accounts in the mission letter Commissioner Nicholas Schmidt received from President Ursula von der Leyen. We are honored to have the Commissioner here today and we'll hear from him directly very soon. The idea and possibility of allowing and encouraging workers and unemployed people to make training rights portable from one employment status to another is a very promising and worth exploring in depth as it speaks to the lifelong learning needs that more and more adults face in the constantly changing environment of today. Stefano Scarpetta, Director for Employment, Labor and Social Affairs at the OECD, will help us understand whether ILAs, individual learning accounts, are more a panacea or a Pandora's box. To quote the title of the very timely report, the OECD published on the subject. After a short round of Q&A, following our keynotes, risks and opportunities related to the ILAs will be discussed by a formidable panel, moderated by Hanka Boldermann, from J.P. Morgan Global Philanthropy. I'd like to take advantage of this moment to thank J.P. Morgan, which has not only supported this event, but supports also Digital Skill Shift, our project devising specially tailored training programs to reskill and upskill citizens not working in the ICT sector. This project, where we partner with organizations from France, Germany and Italy will be particularly interesting from the point of view of ILAs, as France has adopted them, whereas Germany and Italy haven't. In the panel, we are happy to have Antoine Saint-Denis, Director of Europe and International at the Ministry for Labour in France, Eva Maydell, MEP, Member of the Committee on Industry, Research and Energy. Brikena Shomaki, Executive Director of the Lifelong Learning Platform and an expert of the study group on this topic in the European Economic and Social Committee. And Robert Plummer, Senior Advisor at Business Europe. There will be 15 minutes of Q&A after the panel and after that, the Chair of our Board at All Digital, Professor Achilles Kamias, will do the sum up of the event. Many thanks again to all of you for coming, and let me thank my staff, especially Ian Clifford, Victoria Sanz, Peter Pagolzi, and Pia Khrunovov for the tremendous work leading to this event. And now, please help me welcome Commissioner Schmidt to the podium. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure for me to be here tomorrow, uh, t this morning and to have this uh, exchange with you on one of, uh, I think, the biggest challenge, 
challenges uh, we all face and uh, Europe is facing. And uh, I appreciate very much the work which is done by All Digital because you respond to this challenge and uh, you make it accessible for uh, a majority of, uh, of citizens because uh, it's not just an economic challenge, it's uh, really a societal challenge. It's something which uh, transforms our societies and uh, gives opportunities, equal opportunities to everybody. And this is, I think, uh, one of the uh, key issues. Skills, uh, uh, as you mentioned already, are key for the future. Only with skilled workforce can Europe reap the benefits of the green and digital transitions. While, and I insist very much on that, and this has been also uh, repeated or is repeated every time by the President of the Commission, while leaving no one behind. This means that we have to anticipate major changes on the labor market and give workers the skills and capabilities needed for the future workforce and workplace. This means also that we need a reskilling revolution. It's not just adding a bit here and adding a bit uh, there. It's a real revolution we need. And the challenge is huge because Europe faces still important skills gaps and mismatches. 35% of the EU labor force does not have at least basic digital skills, while 90% of all jobs have some digital content. So you, know, you, you, uh, you, you are aware of, the, of the, uh, the gap which exists on the labor market. 40% of employers have difficulties in finding candidates with the right uh, skills and 70% of European enterprises report lack of skills hampers their investments. So there is a loss of growth, there is a loss of growth potential uh, in our economies and there is a loss also of new employments and jobs. According to the OECD, I speak <coughs> under the control <laughs> of Mr. Scarpetta, more than one in four adults reported a mismatch between their current skills, skill sets and the qualifications required to their jobs. So uh, this, are, uh, this is uh, 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 the scene center. So there, there is really a need given, given these uh, this, uh, gaps and, 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 and problems and mismatches for a skills revolution. <coughs> So, uh, in addition, there are no more jobs for life. People may need to navigate their way through multiple job transitions in the course of their careers. Our labor markets are characterized by a growing mobility. We have to give workers desirable job transition options. And in this perspective, reskilling, upskilling, and lifelong learning are imperative but only 11.1% of adults take part in education and training. So we are facing a huge skills gap. This has very negative consequences for the economy in terms of growth potential, but it has also a detrimental impact for each individual worker who is under risk of displacement. Up or reskilling is the only way to securing employment and offering new stable jobs opportunities. It's key for combining the need for mobility on the labor market on one hand with the right to secure living conditions on the other. There will be also a need for adequate social protection and insurance mechanisms that avoid destabilizing income, and I would say destabilizing lives. So we have also new forms of work, what we call the platform work or gig economy. And uh, here the question of access to learning is uh, also a big uh, issue because uh, uh, as the platforms do not consider themselves as employers, something we have 
perhaps to clarify in the forthcoming years, well, the, the people working on these platforms do not get any training or skilling uh, offered by their employers or those they are working for. And this is uh, some kind of a discrimination and therefore we have really to look after the right formula, the right uh, approaches, how we can open precisely a right to lifelong learning uh, for everybody. Because this right should be accessible to everybody independently from their employment statute. And uh, this is more, even more uh, necessary because we are in an economy based on knowledge and an economy which is characterized by a very rapid change, technological change. So if you are working on a platform and you do not have the possibilities to be retrained, to be reskilled in, uh, in, a, in a, a continuous way, well, you risk to be very, very soon deconnected uh, uh, in, your, in your job. And, Assuming that you can, can do that on a purely individual base for the time being is not always possible. So I think we have to create this individual right and in this context certainly the compte personnel is, uh, is the right uh, approach because the compte personnel is attached not to the job but it's attached to the person. We will, uh, the Commission will present an updated skills agenda uh, at the end of the first quarter uh, of this year. Uh, the update of the skills agenda will an announce at the same time the launch of a pact for skills in order for all stakeholders, and when I talk about stakeholders, I mean also business, I mean uh, enterprises, to generate new concrete commitments to invest in up and reskilling. It will allow us to respond to the extent and speed of change in the economy and society. It will also allow us to face the disruptive changes in the labor market. And I see three major changes which we have to uh, take fully into account. First, we have to engage employers to upscale their training provisions. That's what the Pact for Skills is all about. Investing in their workforce should be considered as an investment equal to the one in machines or in robots. From uh, the accounting point of view as well as from the taxation point of view. So giving re upscaling. Second, we have to step up public and private investment in training. Uh, if it's true, and I think uh, it, w it is true, that half of our workforce in Europe has to be retrained within the next five years. So more than a hundred million people to be retrained in five years, that means a lot, a lot of millions, of billions of investment in training. So we have to see how this can be shouldered, how this can be financed. This cannot be financed only by companies. This can be partly financed by public authorities, by public budgets, but we have also to be innovative. We have to take some money out of the financial markets to invest in training and retraining. So creating the right financial tools to invest in training. And here I can say that uh, the IEB, the European Investment Bank, is already working on the right financial instruments to be directed in, uh, in uh, 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 the financing of skills and upskilling and reskilling. So uh, the European budget will certainly not be able to finance it, so we have to look for new possibilities. And my third point is empower people to invest in their own skills and qualifications. That's the more individual character, and here, as I said already, the uh, individual learning account is certainly one interesting um, uh, approach. But it's not just about having an account or having some money on the account. This implies that 
we are working very much on the mindset. Because uh, for the time being, a lot of people recognize perhaps that there is a need for them to invest in their own skills. But uh, from the awareness and the practice, there might be also some gap. So we have to work on the mindset. We have to make clear that mobility on the labor market is not something which uh, is negative. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we have to make sure that mobility goes with some security. And here, um, uh, replacement, re revenue replacement are very important. If people have the feeling that if they, are go, if they go for training, but they have a big question mark on their revenue, how this uh, can be assured, uh, especially when they are out of work or when they uh, have to be less, or, or if they, uh, they have to work less, this might hamper their intentions and uh, um, uh, uh, readiness to, uh, to use their, uh, their, their account. So your revenue and, and uh, individual learning account have to be, in some way, have to be uh, connected. So one word on the individual learning accounts, I think, uh, as I said, it's an important new step uh, which uh, brings, uh, which puts everybody into a new uh, responsibility environment for, uh, for uh, skilling or reskilling uh, everybody. Uh, but uh, we also have to study what is the relationship between this individual learning account and, uh, and the responsibility of the employer or former employer or other institutions. So I think uh, these are issues certainly Mr. Scarpetta might, uh, uh, might uh, uh, discuss because uh, this is also a point which has been uh, uh, mentioned in, uh, in uh, the report uh, OECD has produced in, uh, uh, recently on uh, individual learning accounts. I uh, can say that certainly this idea of individual learning accounts, which is now, which has been introduced at least in one country very formally in France with, uh, I think also uh, already some interesting uh, success uh, and which is also in the process of being reformed or adapted. Uh, uh, I think you, uh, somebody will, you will uh, uh, talk about that. Uh, the Commission has the intention to, to, to take this idea and uh, into the skills agenda and try uh, what and, and see how can the European Union help member states to promote this, uh, this uh, instrument. Uh, what are the best practices and what uh, should be the environment, what should be the governance of this, uh, of this instrument. I think this is very important uh, in order certainly to attract uh, as many people as possible to this uh, instrument. So tr three final remarks. First, how can we better cover certain categories of workers through this instrument of individual learning account? Because we know that um, especially those who are the least skilled uh, are those who are not really benefiting from uh, reskilling or upskilling uh, programs. So how can we, through this uh, individual learning account, promote, especially for these categories uh, uh, who, who, who need reskilling most, uh, how can we promote that? Second, what about uh, those who are in very new forms of labor, I mentioned it already, the platform workers, how can they use this instrument to new way or this new way of uh, working where everybody has periods of work, of reskilling, of transitions. How uh, we, we perhaps have to accept that um, employment should be qualified as a transition from one job to another. But during this period, we have to, that they have a replacement, and third, that they use this time in a part required by the labor market. 
a GS uh, instrument. So uh, that's an ongoing project and we rely very much on uh, in this key issue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Renato, and thank you to All Digital for inviting me uh, to this conference. Commissioner, uh, distinguished participant, ladies and gentlemen, it's really a great pleasure for me to be here with you, uh, and really to follow from the uh, introduction by the Commissioner's Meet uh, to discuss uh, some of the evidence uh, from a report we have just uh, published last year. This is the report. Indeed, the title is Individual Learning Accounts, Panacea or Pandora Box, with a question mark. For those of you like the Commission who are very busy, there is also a little leaflet that you can download uh, from the web page that basically comes up with the main lessons uh, uh, from uh, this report. I think as the Commissioner said himself, uh, this is very much uh, uh, work in progress in the sense that, as you will see, uh, the evidence we are able to collect, we have been able to collect on properly defined individual learning account is fairly limited because it's basically one country in the European Union, France, was really what could be defined uh, properly an individual learning account. In the report, actually, we draw from the experience of other similar systems that could be called individual learning systems that have a number of similar features, in particular, the focus on the individual, but actually have different characteristics, different modalities in the way in which uh, uh, they are designed and actually implemented. Um, the first point I want to make before actually I get into the individual learning account is in the context in which uh, uh, this reflection uh, is happening. And indeed, the, the commissioner mentioned that himself. Um, the first thing is actually that, um, as the commissioner said itself, our labor market is changing very rapidly in a very deep uh, foundation basis, I would say. So the top, you see that for the past decade, four in every 10 new jobs that we have been creating in the OECD countries have been in the digital intensive sector. So there's a lot of job creation we are reaching a new record high level in terms of employment rate, right? people are working age <coughs> with a job. Many of these jobs actually are the digital intensive sector. The second point I want to focus is what is on the bottom of this slide. Actually, sometimes we think about labor market as uh, defined within national boundaries. But actually, if you look at the data about trade flows and how many workers actually are in sectors that are heavily interrelated with the companies in different countries, you <coughs> discover that in the OECD countries, almost 40%, more than 40%, all the workers are working for foreign consumers and not just for domestic consumers. And in Europe, actually, this is about 45% on average. So many of the jobs are very much part of global supply chains, and whatever happens in an individual country may have huge implication for the ability of the companies in this country to position themselves along the global supply chain. The third, of course, important is that in Europe, most countries, if not all, are aging very rapidly, which actually is changing the size of the labor force, the composition of the labor force, and to some extent also demand for goods and services of our citizens, of our consumers. The dependency rate is moving from one person 65 and plus for every four people of working age. By 2050, on average, this would be one person every two people of working age. In some of the European countries, the ratio is actually seven to 10. So uh, it's much, much uh, higher. And actually, if you look at the economic dependence, in my country, in Italy, by 2050, that potentially, at the participation rate of today, there would be more people who are 50 plus inactive for the work, for every work. Of course, this means that there's a huge pressure actually to raise participation rate. So big, uh, uh, if you like, mega trends that are affecting the labor market. The second point is that uh, the digital transformation is really changing in a very profound way. Our economy is <coughs> a different way to characterize that one is actually to look at uh, the penetration of industrial robots in production processes. These are data coming from the, business, uh, the Boston Consulting Group. So you see the penetration, the annual uh, supply of industrial robots, and this is an exponential increase over time. 
Uh, there were only 83,000 in 2005, and by 2021, so next year, more than 600,000. One interesting point about that is that in the United States, owning and using a robot costs in between 10 and $20 an hour. This is less than the cost of a, uh, a manual worker, actually a specialized, particular specialized work in the manufacturing sector. So to some extent, robots are already there, are being used more extensively in many production processes, and they tend to be quite cheap. So the question about how to foster the complementarity between what the workers can do and should do, and what the machine, the algorithm, the robots can, uh, will be able to do. The other point, again, uh, we are moving into the future, of course, there's a lot of uncertainty. USP has done some estimates of the potential number of jobs at risk of being automated. This is not for tomorrow, it's more for the next 15 to 20 years. It's draw from the experience of uh, AI engineers and so on and so forth. The tasks that potentially the algorithm, the artificial intelligence, the machine learning can do in the future. And you see the numbers are not 50% of the workforce, but still 14% in the UAE, 17% in the EU are jobs that where most of the tasks could potentially be performed by machine, by algorithm, not tomorrow, in the next 15 to 20 years. So it's still uh, across the OECD about 80 million jobs that could potentially be fully automated. However, there is another perhaps more interesting part because uh, about one third of the job will go through found really deep uh, transformation, will be completely overhauled because 50 to 70% of the tasks that perform in this job could potentially be made by algorithm by machines. This means that the job will stay, but the work would have to actually move into performing different tasks, new tasks, to remain fully complementary to what the machine will be able to do. Again, I use the could, the hood, because there is a lot of uncertainty, and policy can play a major role on the speed and the depth of penetration of new technology, digital technology, into our economies. Uh, but the changes are there. So the commissioner was mentioning an important point, and this is about the fact that the labor market is also changing in terms of the nature of the job. Sometimes when we talk about that, we tend to focus immediately on the crowd work, platform work, and so on and so forth. One of the major uh, frustrations I have is that I cannot tell you how many workers we have in Europe that actually work exclusively or largely for platform work. We don't, we don't really have a good estimate, but still it's a pretty small number, between half a percentage point, sometimes three percentage point. But there are many other forms of non-standard form of employment, everything that is not a full-time open-ended contract that actually are there, represent all, more than a third of total employment, that have some element of independence, but also some key element of uh, to some dependence and to some extent also vulnerability, similar to the one we might find among the employees. Yet, our social protection system, our labor market policy, our training systems are not really eager to provide the support, adequate support to these workers in non-standard form of employment. There are huge differences across countries, but there are significant gaps in most of the countries. So the question, as Commissioner said, we really have to rethink basically all our institution and policy to make sure that we provide adequate services, not just to the traditional employees with an open-ended, long-standing contract with their employer, but actually to all these other workers who might be in this different type of non-standard form of employment. And indeed, there is an increase in the fragmentation in the labor market. One way to characterize that is to look at job tenure. Actually, if you look at job tenure in absolute, it has been going on in most of the OECD and European countries. But this also is largely driven by the fact that there has been an aging of the workforce, so people stay in the job longer because they've been there longer. Uh, if you actually control for that, you see that in many countries there has been a reduction in the job tenure. So people move more frequently from one job to the other, I would say from one status into the labor market into another, and from one occupation into another. There is more fragmentation in the careers, meaning that people are moving more frequently from one job to the other, and much sometimes actually they change their own career. So this fragmentation of careers and higher job mobility is one of the key factors that justify the focus, which I think is absolutely important, on training per se, but actually within that context also on the individual training, uh, learning account. Um, let me move on to the, uh, the issue of training. Again, on aggregate, we see more employment, but when we look at the composition of employment, there are huge changes in the composition of employment. We have lost many jobs in manufacturing. We have created many, many more jobs in service sector. And within service sector, there has been huge variation in the uh, sector that have created more jobs, and those actually have been shrinking. So large changes in the composition of employment. As the commissioner said, if you look at the adult skills survey of the OECD, this reveals you that uh, 
more than half of the workforce has very little, if any, uh, digital skills. And any of the jobs of the future would involve some sort of digital skill. We're not talking about having everybody be uh, coders, but some minimal uh, knowledge of digital skills, uh, digital, I think, is very important. And so this is the size of the issue we are trying to tackle. We are talking about training and retraining not just a few workers, a few unemployed people, but actually my, many people in the workforce. As the commissioner has said, almost half of the workforce, if not more. It's not just for tomorrow, but the horizon is not even 20 or 30 years. We are talking about the next five to 10 years. So this is a huge, daunting challenge that indeed requires uh, a lot of investment thinking of what is the best way to approach this, this challenge. Now, uh, you might say, well, the training system are there, maybe they're already providing their own uh, uh, response to these challenges, what is the evidence there? Well, the evidence is not particularly encouraging, I would say. There are huge differences across countries, even within Europe, about how many workers are exposed to some form of formal and informal training every year. But what I want to show you, rather, is actually the average for the OECD countries on the gap that do exist in basically each and every country, including the European countries, in access to formal and informal training between the, frankly speaking, those who needed the least and those who needed the most. So at the bottom, you see those who potentially needed the most, so the low skilled. These are the jobs more at risk of being automated, are the low skilled jobs. Uh, the uh, self-employed, those on temporary contracts and the part-timers, all of them receive much less training than those at the, bottom, at the top of this chart. So those who are high skilled, uh, full-time permanent contracts, and, and so on. So to some extent, and this again is not just in one individual country, across the board, our training system tend to devote more resources de facto to those who already have fairly high skill uh, working in large companies and those who can navigate perhaps better these transformations into the labor market, those more vulnerable actually tend to receive less training. So this is basically a quick motivation of why I think uh, the focus on individual learning account is very important. Let's move into that. Um, the first point I want to mention is that this is not new. A number of countries introduced individual learning system, not accounts, back in the 90s already. I would argue that the motivation for this was somewhat different. Back in the 90s, I think one of the motivations to, was to create a market for training, to get, give more responsibility, but also raising the demand on individual workers on training, create some competition in the market, therefore also stimulate the creation of providers of training. To some extent, the new focus on individual learning accounts is more on the need to respond to the changes we have seen in the labor market with a greater fragmentation to the labor market and the need to ensure that training is portable or training rights are portable. You can keep your training rights even if you change job, even if you change employment status, even if you change occupation. So to some extent, it's the notion that training cannot be attached to a job but should be attached to an individual but also to actually give more responsibility to individual, empower the individual to be able to think through, and that's exactly the uh, change in thinking, if you like, that the commissioner was referring to, in the mindset of workers that have to become a bit more responsible for their own future. Now, the problem with that is that, and I was mentioning that before, is that if I have to focus specifically on individual learning accounts, I can only report. So what we did, we bring together different individual learning systems some of them actually are more voucher schemes that support training through direct government payment uh, uh, to the training providers, or individual savings account, which basically involve financial <coughs> institutions, but also supported by uh, savings from uh, public authorities. So here we bring the experience of a different country, a number of commonalities, but also some difference, which I think are very important to bear in mind. So the first point I want to mention, this is lesson number one, Let's be clear what is the objective of the individual learning account. This can be to provide autonomy in the training choice uh, to the workers, increase the transferability, as I mentioned before, of training rights across jobs, even labor market status, reaching out to some of the underrepresented groups that I mentioned before. Uh, and these are very different objectives that actually, to some extent, justify the use of individual learning account as a complement to the existing training system may exist in a country, or to some extent, like in the French case, to become the main way to provide access to training for many of the workers, actually many of those in the labor market, not just the employees, but actually including the self-employed. So the focus, what is the objective, I think is very important. If the objective, for example, is to 
try to reach out to the most disadvantaged, those who receive less training, as you will see in a second, a number of specific features of the system have to be designed very well because you might not get that. I can think to some extent that the early experience of the French system points in that direction. Uh, the second point is, again, financial resources. Um, a number of the schemes that we've been able to review tend to provide limited uh, resources uh, in terms of the amount of money that is available for the individual, uh, which basically reduce the duration of the training, but even the outcome that you can get out of that particular training. Uh, and might also reduce to some extent uh, the uh, participation of the system. Um, in this, it's, it's very important to identify whether you want to start targeting to some individual that need it most, or whether you really want to have universal system that basically provide the same amount of money like the French system, to all individual work. If you do that, even in a country like France that spent a lot of money on training and training programs, of course the amount that goes to each individual becomes somewhat smaller. Now in the French you can accumulate the contribution every year, so at the end, after a few years, you can get a significant amount of money that will lead you to actually a significant training, uh, training course. But otherwise, the amount of money that is available, I think is important to, to some extent, uh, in, have an impact on the the effect of this training and the choice of the, of the type of training that the individual actually pursue. The lesson number three is actually that um, there are two sorts of possible financing, of course. One is to, to finance that through tax finance system, which of course is, re is redistributed as much as the income tax system is redistributed. Um, or the other is actually to have training levies, like in the French case, which however can include some element to mutualization because in the French case, for example, small firms pay less in terms of the fees to the training fund. So again, through the two financing system, you can still try to focus more or earmark more resources to those who potentially need it the most. So those who with low skills or potentially have more need or need more encouragement, more support in order to participate in the training program itself. But financing and the way in which you finance it is very, very important. Which brings me for the four lessons, which I think is perhaps one of the most important one. Uh, the preliminary evidence, and I really rely on the French colleague here to, to go more into that, but also from the other uh, individual learning system, is that uh, the high skilled people know very well how to use it. And they run with it. They know how to use it, they know what kind of training providers are out there. They might have a better sense of what type of training they really need in order to improve, to make a click in their CV, to actually improve their own uh, performance within the company to move to new company. As I, I showed you before, actually access to individual learning accounts for the low skill is much lower in all the country for which we have the evidence for a number of reasons. First, because they might not know exactly what kind of training opportunities are out there. Second of all, because the training may remind them of the education system that might not have been a very successful, very positive experience for them. So the notion of going back to a classroom is something that many people would not like to repeat or to replicate but also because they need a huge amount of the key fact that emerges is that the lack of motivation by many workers. They don't think they need training, they don't think they can afford training, they don't think they can stay out of work for a significant period of time. So we have to tackle this motivation, which is very much a motivation within the very significant constraint that people face themselves. Um, the other thing, and again, uh, these are from the French system, but also from the other system in the countries, keep the uh, governance of the process as simple as possible. I think the first experience in France, 2015, 2018, was pretty complex. So uh, again, the high skill can navigate, can actually see what are the rights, how to use, with which other providers, and so on and so forth. Others got basically blocked by the complexity of navigating the system, understanding how to use this right that they have acquired. Uh, actually, the technology here can be a huge enabler because the digital technology, including apps, which exist now in France and a number of other countries, can make it much, much easier. But let's not forget that some of the low skill have very little digital skills, and therefore, even the ability to navigate on a platform or on a, on application might be not the same as an high skilled person. So to some extent, if you keep this, the system simple, and if you provide guidance, including through an app, then you can really try to reach out to a wide uh, range of individual potential beneficiaries. The Singaporean model in that respect, I think, is quite interesting because it has developed the app and actually has made the system as simple as possible. It's more like a voucher, an open-ended voucher scheme, but seems to have high pick-up rate also because it simplified dramatically the system itself. Um, the sixth lesson is, uh, again, uh, target or non-target. That's the point. 
And to some extent, if you target, you reduce the, um, the focus on the high skill, so you reduce the dead weight cost, so those who will actually will involve in training, you know, pain by themselves. Um, the problem is that these also make it, uh, to some extent, may raise the administrative burden of managing the system, and also to some extent may go against one of the objectives of the uh, ILA. So that is to say to promote or to recognize the significant mobility and fragmentation of the system. So if I'm only receiving the training because I'm in a particular type of job or particular type of skills, if I move into another job, into another occupation, I might lose the right to train. So we have to factor that in when thinking about the targeting and on which base the target is actually made, because this might actually go against uh, the notion of promoting mobility and not, uh, not to some extent uh, 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 reducing that. The seventh and the penultimate lesson is uh, that, uh, again, when we're thinking about the government or enterprise-led training, you're talking about the government, you're talking about large companies. They can check and evaluate and assess the quality of the training providers much, much better than a single individual, right? So they can see, okay, this is a good provider because of good outcomes, both the company, but even, of course, the government. Of course, the individual has many more difficulties in assessing, is this a good provider? How do I assess whether or not the outcomes of this provider are better or at least as good as those of others? So I think you need also uh, a certification of the uh, providers themselves, and there are different ways in which this is done. Sometimes actually certify the training course itself, so you say this is training course that's been certified leading to some improvement in the skills, and this to some extent is the French system because you, get, you can use the resources you are at your disposal for certifying training courses. But I think more generally, I think this is a big push towards certifying <coughs> training providers on the basis of the outcomes they produce, which is a big uh, challenge, of course, in a number of the European, uh, European countries. Um, what is the problem of that is, of course, the more you certify, the more you make it difficult, this market, you might get some of the providers, maybe providing specialized training in some specific areas, not being able to remain to the market. So again, there is a good balance in between the depth of the certification and, uh, if you like, uh, the, the, the market that you are creating. The other point, and this is uh, not in the slide, but in my view is very important before I conclude, is that you need to give opportunity to people to be recognized for what they've learned, not only in education, but actually in the labor market. So the beyond the competence in France, is, I think, is an important element because it gives, to some extent, a tool to an individual to be recognized for what he or she has learned into the labor market over and above the competence that they've acquired during the education period of their life. And that's very important to assess what it is that the worker needs over and above the job that he or she is performing. Final point is, um, and again, this was the point that the commissioner was mentioning himself, uh, let's make sure that the individual learning account is not a way to disengage the employers, right? Because now suddenly the training, the training right is to the individual, the individual chooses the training course, so the employer feels a little bit less engaged into this uh, effort to actually skill and reskill the workforce. So there are ways in which you can do that because in some cases you can get the support of the employer on choosing the training program. Can be a complementary between the individual learning account and uh, the training provided by the employers, but definitely we need the employers on board. We need employers fully on board in helping the worker choosing the type of training, in recognizing these in terms of the work within the company and so on and so forth. So this I think is an important element uh, of, of that. Um, if we, if the individual learning account is shifting the responsibilities to the worker and disengage with the employer, I think we are not uh, reaching out uh, to one of the major objectives of that. And uh, we need to change the culture of learning and really bring it into the notion that all individuals have to think about the future, have to think about the human capital continuously, but actually get the feedback from the employers on what it is that they need for the company in which they work, but also in the medium term also to navigate what is going to be a labor market with many opportunities, but also with a number of challenges. And that, I think, so this cultural change in mindset, I think, is, in my view, extremely important in order to make individual learning account, but more generally, uh, this notion of uh, skilling and reskilling a large fraction of the workforce more important. So these are some of the main lessons in our report. As I said at the beginning, this is very much work in progress, not least because a number of countries are experimenting. I was yesterday with the Minister of Labor of the Netherlands, they're actually introducing an individual learning account themselves, and a number of other countries are actually very interested in the experience of those who have started before, like France, to actually possibly introduce. And of course, the Commission in this, uh, in this respect can make uh, a leading role into promoting this reflection, but also possibly move into concrete actions uh, in the member state of the European Union. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, many, many thanks, uh, Dr. Scott.
that uh, there's a few minutes for questions. We're taking advantage also of the presence of the commissioner here. Are there any questions in relation to both the presentation, uh, the, the keynote and the presentation?
these individuals have learned a lot from this job. If we start recognizing what they have learned, then we can motivate them to participate in training because then they feel empowered to move into the next step through the learning process itself. So I fully agree, but again, my task is also to push a little bit government and employers as well as the trade unions to actually move more completely into this into this uh, business of skilling and skilling. Thank you. We have two more questions, then I think we can prepare ourselves for the panel session. Good morning, Mel Mark from the Eleco Group. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Stefano, for your excellent presentation. Thank you, Commissioner, for your introduction. I wanted to come back to the final point that you made, actually, Stefano, which is about integrating or, or making that link between individual learning accounts and employer provider training. Um, because I, I fully agree, of course, that uh, employers need to invest, and I think a lot of employers do invest a lot in skills. But as the Commissioner highlighted, um, they are very comfortable in investing in the skills of their, let's say, core workforce, but maybe not so much in investing in all those diverse uh, workers in diverse forms of work who also work with these companies. Now, as an echo group, we do invest in these uh, flexible workers, but um, much more can and should be done, of course. And I was wondering, uh, do you have any ideas on how that gap can be bridged between investing in uh, workers with uh, or employer investment in uh, those di diverse uh, uh, types of workers. Thank you very much. We go directly to the second question. <laughs> Renato, can you just please? Okay. No. Okay. <coughs> Sorry. There you go. Yeah, welcome. My name from the Startnet project on young people's transition from education to work at the Goethe Institute. I was alarmed by the fact that you said the workers that need the most training are the less likely to receive it. So I was wondering, uh, how do we manage to reach out to those workers? And if there is also a solution, a preventive approach to start very early. Uh, so already when uh, going to compulsory education system, that there is a connection made to, to all individuals. And there's a culture of long, lifelong learning that is, this is implemented from a young age. Do you see that as a solution to reach those that need most training? Well, it seems to me that both questions verge on the same point. Are we going to invest just on those who already know, or are we also including those who are not normally included? Yeah, so the first question, I think we, I, my former experience showed me that uh, for the interim workers, for instance, uh, interim companies uh, in the country I, I still know quite well, have uh, put up a, a fund for investment in those working uh, normally in the interim business. So they get out of the uh, interim companies skilling and reskilling and upskilling. So this is the responsibility of these uh, interim companies. You, you know something about it. So I think we have to, 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 to broaden it to make much larger the, the investment in, in skilling and upskilling, also for these forms of, uh, new forms of, uh, of, uh, of work. Um, on the other issue, uh, I think there is an, an education, uh, we have to revise also our education system. I think uh, we have to teach people that finally uh, the most important is uh, learning and not learning during the few years you go to school but learning your whole life and again this is not a constraint this should not be perceived as something which is uh, uh, threatening me but it's a positive approach uh, giving people the, uh, the, the opportunity and the tool to be able to learn which might make life more interesting but this is also something you have to learn. Uh, and, and I think this is a process which uh, has to start with our educational system. And this is not obvious because finally our educational systems are lagging quite behind. Not all of us, but you know, you make a lot of studies at the OECD through PISA and other studies. But this is something which is important that uh, you, you learn how to learn during your whole life. And this is a positive approach, not something which uh, should uh, be uh, uh, a cause for a new anxiety. 
on, on the first point, uh, maybe it's important to distinguish uh, uh, the employees, the low skill employees for a particular company from those who are in different type of non-standard form of, uh, of, uh, of labor contract. So, you know, can be a temporary job, can be sort of consultant, can be, and so on and so forth. I think it's difficult to ask companies to invest the same on all their workforce, because of course they are looking at a business case for investing, and they tend to invest on the young, the skilled, more skilled, and so on and so forth. I think uh, promoting a corporate social responsibility with some form of training also for the low skills should be provided by the company. In my view, it's important. The other is those workers that are not completely tied with a particular company, they're not employees, or their relationship with the employer is just a short term. It's difficult to ask them necessarily to invest a lot on them, but because the return to that investment is likely to be low. That's why I think the solution can be a public private partnership with the business investing on those workers in which they think the return can be higher, promote corporate social responsibility whereby they also invest in some of their low skilled workers because they are part of the talent pool that they have in their own company, but actually use the public programs to actually help those who might be actually less supported by training by the employers, by the company for which they perform, either because they're independent workers, uh, independent contractors, or other form of non-standard employment that have a weak link with one single single employer. So that's why the portability and the individual learning account in my view is very important. The second point, and I think the commission gave the answer about the education, I will not get into that, but one in my view of the major challenge of the individual learning account, and we will discuss that in the next panel, is that how do we actually, to some extent, implement the lesson I was showing you before about providing adequate guidance to many workers who and how to best, how to recognize and best use the right they have acquired through the individual learning account. In France, this is through the public employment service. If you ask the public employment service, they say, well, we are already overburdened with work with all the job seekers we have to place into the labor market. We can't really provide adequate guidance and support to the many other workers who are out there and need this support in order to navigate the system, to use it properly, and so on and so forth. This is one of the major challenges. Digital technology can help a lot because it can simplify access to information, but without proper guidance that beyond the competence of the competence assessment and some support on how to use it, what is the pathway to learning more and to, to uh, the adaptation of training, that is going to be a problem in terms of uh, closing the gap in access between <coughs> low skill, those most vulnerable, and the high skill. That's the major challenge. And the traditional institutional system we have in place in Europe, which is basically employment service provided by the public employment service largely in most of the countries, they are overwhelmed. I'm not sure they can, they will, but they will have the capacity to actually provide an adequate support. So targeting and to some extent also invest on the guidance in my view is quite important. Thank you very much. Uh, we need to move now to the, to the panel uh, and we'd like to thank very much the Commissioner Smith for coming. Thank you so much. We, while the panel is about to take place, we have a, a minute of, uh, uh, it's like at the concert when they bring in the piano, so the, the orchestra has to move it. So we're doing it very manually. Voila. So there we go. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much. I invite the panelists here. from my side. My name is Hanka Baudemann. I'm part of JP Morgan's Global Philanthropy Team. Just uh, for those of you who don't know us, why am I here? Uh, basically, our uh, philanthropic mission as a company is really uh, focused, uh, focused on promoting economic inclusion and social mobility across uh, 36 countries um, uh, that we're active in. 
Um, jobs and skills is a key component of that work uh, because we really see it as a key lever for economic participation. And that's why uh, we have also renewed our global initiative, we used this at work uh, last year, which really focuses on preparing adults, especially low-skilled adults who are um, less advantaged in the labor market uh, for the future of work. And of course, um, I'm absolutely delighted as well to be partnering with All Digital on the Digital Skillship Project. Um, training is kicking off this week. And we're looking forward to seeing the results in the summer um, with a um, strong evaluation, really looking at the results for um, participants, but also for companies. So I think um, Commissioner Schmidt and Stefano Scapetta have really laid out a very good foundation for us to touch on. I think this is a very timely debate, a very a debate that's generating a sense of urgency, also with the challenges uh, that we've seen. So I just want to um, you know, lay out a couple of the themes again uh, before we dive in uh, to the detailed discussion. So one is, so when we think about adult learning, it's really about preparing for the future. So Commissioner Schmidt referenced the green and digital uh, transformation. So to what extent can adult learning help achieve that? Oftentimes, I think the reality is currently um, that learning is not focused on future, but hope. Um, then the other point is, you know, how our roles, you know, people move through the system. It's very much provided by the state, um, but uh, for adults, there's a clear responsibility for the workers themselves and for the companies, and it's something that we touched on. And um, yeah, so we'll go deeper on that. And then finally, this point of leaving nobody behind. Um, we heard about some of the challenges um, also already in the questions. Um, but when we think of um, uh, individual learning accounts, um, to what extent can funding mechanisms like that help overcome that challenge? Um, but also, how is it complemented in terms of you know, addressing other issues that especially low-skilled workers face, so time, uh, that they don't have at the workplace, also information and guidance um, that they need much more um, than high-skilled workers, um, but also a supportive environment, um, so to the extent that employers can support them and also uh, provide concrete progression pathways. Um, I think that those are all key topics. So with that in mind, um, I'm really happy to introduce my very knowledgeable panel here. Um, starting um, with Antoine uh, Sanzini next to me. So Antoine is a Director of Europe and International uh, for the Department of Jobs and Vocational Training at the Ministry of Labour in France, and he'll be able to tell us a lot about the uh, uh, personnel and the formation. Uh, then we have um, Eva Meder, um, <laughs> Member of the European Parliament. Um, it was already mentioned by Renato at the beginning. Um, uh, you're a member of the Committee on Industry, Research and Energy, but you're also um, uh, ambassador for the European Commission um, eSkills for Jobs Initiative. Um, so I, I think your view on those future-looking topics will be very important. Then we have Robert Plummer uh, from Business Europe, uh, your senior advisor for issues on migration and mobility, education and skills. So really looking forward to hear your view on the employer um, role. Um, and then Christina Chomaki, uh, Director of the Lifelong Learning Platform, uh, which gathers 40 uh, European civil society organizations and networks um, with a strong um, expertise on education and also how civil society can play a role. So maybe let's start with you, Antoine. Um, I mean, it was referenced in France. Um, so maybe from that. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Um, there is an immediate need for a clarification, which is the following. What Mr. Scarpetta from OECD referred to in the OECD assessment was uh, the ILA dating back from 2015. And what I'm going to refer to right now is a different system with the same name, which has been modernized. So what I'm referring to is a new digital 
to the service that we launched last November and as a way to give you a brief description of what it consists in, uh, we did not find any better solution than a short video, if we then can... If I can make it work? Show, yeah, yeah, exactly. Thank you, Adam. <coughs> Il existe une appli qui vous permet de voir de combien d'euros vous disposez pour payer la formation dont vous avez besoin. Aujourd'hui, il existe une appli qui vous permet de voir de combien d'euros vous disposez pour payer la formation dont vous avez besoin. Simple, pratique, direct. Téléchargez l'appli Mon Compte Formation. Aujourd'hui, il existe une appli qui change tout à la formation professionnelle. Mon Compte Formation vous permet d'entrer sur votre espace personnel, de connaître vos droits, de voir de combien d'euros vous disposez, de sélectionner une formation proche de chez vous ou en ligne, <coughs> et de vous inscrire. Fini la paperasse. Simple, pratique, direct. Téléchargez l'appli Mon Compte Formation. Thank you. So you see, it's, it's an app, my, Mon Compte Formation in my uh, training account. Uh, it's an app, it's a website, it's a new digital service that is accessible for people to to do three things. The first they can do is that they can check their rights. Secondly, they can book some training in the catalog. And, uh, and, and, and before this, they can choose uh, the training itself. Uh, it's based on the fact that uh, since 2015, there, are, there is a portable right to training in France. And this uh, training was converted last year into, I mean, from a number of hours to a number, to an amount of money. So the amount of money for people is basically 500 euro per year until 5,000 euro. And if you belong to a disadvantaged group, then you, if you are a low qualified person or uh, a disabled person, 8,000 uh, euro. Uh, I insist that this new system of uh, portable rights for uh, every active person in the country uh, is not based on uh, new taxes for the employers, uh, but on a specific use of money collected uh, from uh, them. I also need to, to make it clear that there is a possibility to get some compliments uh, these components are not rights or are <coughs> not rights uh, embedded in, 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 in the account itself, but it's clear that there are many situations where you need to rely on more money, mainly if you are uh, depending on your training, of course, but uh, uh, this means that uh, if you're a job seeker or if your employer wants to, to, to put additional money or if yourself you want to invest in your training, there will be the possibility to, 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 to add some money to, to this. As you can see, it's extremely recent. We only have a, a, a three months overview, but let's see a few figures. Um, and the results are promising. The app was downloaded in, in digital smartphones one million times. Uh, three, one employee out of four, have already checked uh, the amount of, of rights. So far, we have more than 200,000 files created and more than 136 trainings validated. And the excellent piece of news is that uh, the employees and the workers, and more generally the low qualified people, have a share in the overall use, which 
has been higher during these three months. So regarding what was said by uh, Commissioner Schmidt and uh, Mr. Scarpetta, this is extremely uh, promising. The average amount of uh, the training uh, booked online is 1,200 euro, and uh, the overall amount of uh, individual money added by uh, the trainees has been uh, 500 euro. You see, so it's still it's still beginning, but hopefully for us in our country that's the start of uh, something uh, extremely basically new. Yes, and. Um can you hear me? Yeah. Um, it definitely also touches on the question of culture of training. Um, so doing a, a, a campaign, I think it's an interesting uh, model. Um, you mentioned that uh, the, the share of low-skilled, low-qualified workers is relatively high, at least in comparison. Um, what have you done to raise the share um, of, of low-qualified workers well, in the system? There has been a big campaign. But it's it's just a start, and as Commissioner said, uh, it's it, it, it's it's uh, it's about working on, on the mindset, and it's mm -hmm. clear that uh, the Abdel does a signal for for people uh, that they have the opportunity to invest in their training, and and, and that it's worth uh, for for them having the sense of responsibility, and it's about empowering them, but. We, it's much more than that, of course, uh, and that will not be enough. Uh, we have taken some measures to guarantee the quality of trainings because training providers have to be accredited because uh, there is uh, some mechanisms to ensure the quality of the training. Only certified um, um, trainings can, can be registered online. Uh, we also implementing, we will also implement soon a rating system so that people can, can express and can see the impact of the training uh, purchased by, by order on uh, the career pathway. And we don't want to leave people alone, especially when we target the, the most uh, disadvantaged groups. So we have created for SWB a pro professional development advisor system, and uh, this professional development advisor system will be accessible, or is already accessible for SWB, and uh, we will reinforce the capacity uh, to liaise for specific groups, including the job seekers or the low qualified people. Great, thanks. Um, can I move on to Gretchena? If you would like to pass the microphone. Um, so in your view, um, how can individual learning accounts really change you know, the education and training approach for learners, including adults? Um, coming from the civil society network, I would like to first uh, say that we welcome, of course, the uh, idea of individual learning accounts is, I would, define it uh, as an extension of a fundamental right for education and training. So this is something that we are not inventing, of course. The UN is also promoting the same idea of lifelong learning entitlement. So the right to education and training is a fundamental right and the public uh, responsibility. So of course, the way we see it is an extension of what we already do. So. Uh, this is nothing new in itself, and uh, I have to say that the education sector has been uh, extending the offer to adults. Uh, so uh, ages uh, of individuals can go back to universities has, has also extended. So in a way, it's nothing new. It's in a way putting more pressure to the education and training uh, sector to uh, modernize and to in a, improve the access, access to uh, the training offer. Uh, but also rethink the way they do it because, like it was said for the OEC, from the OECD, a lot of learners have a very um, often bad experience with the formal <coughs> education system. They don't want to go back to the usual uh, formal education system. Uh, and that's why it's important in this context that uh, non formal education uh, providers they take, uh, they position themselves in this offer. Uh, and they are maybe better fit for this. Um, but uh, 
uh, again, uh, we have to um, really see this as uh, something <coughs> that is giving an opportunity to different forms of education to uh, complete each other, to, um, uh, to cooperate between each other, to create these flexible pathways where an individual learner can have multiple entry points to the education system and different forms of education. So this is something that we welcome, of course. Um, I wanted, of course, to mention some of the issues for this to actually be able to happen. And uh, uh, we as a platform, we promote lifelong learning, but lifelong learning cannot happen from one day to another. And it's something uh, that is very much linked to the um, a competence of learning how to learn. And this has to be developed and still developed early enough. So while we uh, try to intervene in this target group, we shouldn't forget measures that would address that as early as possible in the education system. So that's why it's not just about the training that can be provided in companies, but it's also about how the education as early as possible will adapt to this training need later on and, pro and, and motivate people to continue learning. Um, Robert, um, so you're here really looking at the view of the historians, right? Um, so from that perspective, um, what do you think? Can individual learning accounts really provide a valuable funding mechanism for supporting upskilling? And I mean, we talked about this. Um, it's, you know, it's the pressure of upskilling, but also the opportunity. How do you see this um, at this point? Thank you. Um, well, I think firstly, we certainly see a change, the, the economy, etc. cetera. Um, so I think there's no question uh, in, in the minds of, of, of employers, of, of companies, sorry, etc. cetera, um, that, uh, that there's a need to, to upskill and reskill. Um, and indeed, that this should be seen as an investment in, um, in wealth. Um, and we see that there's a number of um, challenges companies face, in particular around skills mismatches leading to labour shortages. It was also mentioned um, by uh, Commissioner Schmidt and uh, Mr. Chopetta as well. Um, and at the same time, we shouldn't forget, I think we've heard many interesting statistics already uh, this morning, but we do already see that around two thirds, I think 67% of companies do invest in um, education and training for their workforce. So we're also not starting from, from nothing, but certainly more can be done, and, and indeed we think more, uh, more should be done as well. And when it comes to the, the way in which training is provided, we also see that there's different ways that that is done in different member states. Um, and there's that element of flexibility that we think also <coughs> needs to be um, retained at the national level, taking into account the, the nature of the industrial relations system, the existing education and training practices, and the role of the different actors, social partners, companies, education training providers, the governments, um, play <coughs> in, in those different systems. Um, so that's something that we, we think is important to, um, to continue to give the space to at the national level, uh, especially when we think about it. So learning accounts in particular, um, I think to an extent we're all sort of in this European policy field in a, in a sort of moment of reflection and, and exploration. I think the, 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 the comments in the, the mission letter um, to Commissioner Schmidt to, to look at this issue on, on learning accounts has also prompted uh, reflections for us internally as well. Um, and I think, you know, preliminary views from our side uh, at this stage, but um, I think having in mind what I just said about the flexibility and the different approaches nationally, um, there is some hesitation perhaps on our side at the moment from the, the company perspective as to whether learning accounts are the, the famous silver bullet that will really make sure that everyone who really needs training will get access to it. Um, I think from when we talk with our members initially, I think the feeling is, yes, learning accounts might be a good approach. Um, our French member is optimistic that they will work in, in the 
French context, and I think it's encouraging to hear um, what Antoine said. Um, maybe in other countries, in other contexts, um, they may it may be harder to implement that sort of approach. Um, and I think there's a feeling perhaps that something we need to explore more is whether the learning account approach will really address those who most need the training, which tends to be the low skilled. Um, if there is, <coughs> it's not just about the money, but if there is <coughs> available financing, um, are the low skilled going to be able to know how best to access and utilize that? And that comes back to the point of guidance and support, which indeed I think is, is very important because if we would have that approach, we would need to make sure that it's not just the already highly skilled and the highly motivated that would access the, the funding and know where to go to take part in training, etc. Um, and <coughs> yeah, I think that point of um, ensuring the wider participation and, and also the motivation, um, because it's also always a discussion we have with, with our trade union counterparts and uh, I can fairly reflect their view on that as well, that we have a shared understanding that it's, yes, there's a role for companies to provide um, training, but there's also a role for, for workers, for trade unions to, to be motivated to take part in the training. Um, and that's something that uh, we need to really highlight and looking at that mindset issue that, uh, that has been mentioned by several speakers already today as well. Um, so to see how best to to tap into the possibilities that exist, and as I say, learning accounts are one way potentially to do that, um, but not the only way. So I think we need to take that into into consideration as well. And I just want to follow up question. So I mean, there is a learning course to do training, um, but there are other areas on the company side, on the individual side, uh, for actually you know moving ahead. And doing the training also in terms of available offers. So to what extent um, do you think an individual learning account or other funding mechanism would increase you know, the um, willingness of employers to um, invest in, in their workforce, co-invest, mm -hmm. um, or just generally you know, support them um, in, in that effort? So. Yeah, I think, Indeed, we would need to make sure if you have a learning individual learning account, it, indeed you wouldn't discourage the, the employer involvement. I, and I think that's a very good point that um, Stefan and Scott Piper ended on, saying that we shouldn't have a disconnect, if we have learning accounts, we shouldn't have a disconnect between the role of the employer in the training and the indivi in individual, because for us it's very important that companies do have a say in the content, the orientation of the training. Um, of course, that means that there needs to be some level of investment in the companies uh, as well. Um, but uh, I think on the issue of an investment, even if you have an individual learning account, there would be potentially different ways of ensuring the investment. It could be um, indeed entirely funded by the employer, you, or you could have a co-sharing, cost-sharing model where the employer would put something in you could have an automatic deduction from the, the salary of the employee that would also go into the, the account. Um, there could be a role for governments to come in as well. There could be a top up from the government if the, the account, for example, would get to a certain level between the, the amount that the companies and, and the work are put in, and then the government could top that up, um, for example. There's different ways of, of doing it, um, but I think always from the the company, the employer perspective, it's important that the training is somehow oriented towards the, the role that the worker is performing um, in the job that they're doing, whether that's the current moment or the evolution of that job <coughs> in the future. I think that's an important point that needs to be um, brought in and, and associated with how we, we provide the training and, and the content of the training. Super, thanks. Um, anyhow, um, so you focus a lot on e-skills, digital transformation. So how do you see the potential of individual learning accounts also to support the digital transformation and also you know, for Europeans generally to be fit uh, for the digital age? 
Yeah, thank you so much. First of all, thanks for the invitation um, and for uh, the very concrete, actually, discussions that we have today. Because often we do talk about skills and there are representatives from, from, from different uh, um, organizations that do have concrete projects. But I think uh, it's important that we focus on one particular one today. Um, it's always a bit uncomfortable from somebody coming from a parliament, whether national or European, in my case, it's among experts and people that dwell on the topic for a really long uh, time and, and spend their days on that. Uh, so perhaps some of my remarks might be a little bit uh, more political, uh, but sometimes when you want to excel in a certain area, um, you would also need the policy people uh, to chip in if they want um, an idea such as the individual learning accounts uh, to be uh, promoted within their country and to be an actual project that is uh, being uh, realized. So I'll go perhaps a little bit, um, a little bit back um, and then um, I'll answer your question because you mentioned that indeed I do um, work on, on the sphere of digital um, transformation, industrial transformation, uh, but also harnessing the potential of data, uh, for example, as it's a very topical uh, discussion this week uh, for Brussels, I cannot hold myself but, but mention it. Uh, but we uh, often, policymakers, um, don't put enough emphasis on the reasons why actually innovation happens in Europe. And the first and most important principle is the human uh, potential and the human uh, factor. So if we do not tackle the mere reason why Europe could be prosperous or companies could progress, uh, it would be difficult to realize these very ambitious goals that we have put forward ahead of Europe, and some of them are related uh, especially to, um, to the industrial and uh, transformation that we have to face in the next couple of years. Um, and here I see a couple of <coughs> issues. So the topic of skills has been um, coming and going over the past couple of years, but it has been the first time that in a committee that is not the educational and cultural one in the European Parliament, actually is also my, actually also my colleagues have been interested to discuss the skills in the industry committee. And I'm also very pleased to see that in um, um, papers that are about to come tomorrow, um, um, on AI and data, the part on uh, new skilling and skilling is there. This used not always to be the case uh, before. I personally believe we need to make the topic of uh, where our societies are moving in terms of skills and education a much more prime topic. I often say, uh, and I'll continue repeating it, uh, after many, many years, we finally got the first education summit two years ago or so held in Brussels. I would like to see a European Council dedicated on the topic of skills and upskilling <coughs> professionals because it is the most crucial thing that could lead us to that transformation uh, in the years uh, to come. Uh, so it would require leadership, but it would require concrete actions. And one of these concrete actions could be indeed uh, focus on individual learning accounts. Um, and there are of course many other forms and ways that we could achieve uh, this uh, skills, uh, I mean maybe not achieve, but bridge this gap between the skills mismatch that we currently have. I have to tune in and join uh, the rest of the speakers of saying that the first thing we actually have to tackle is um, the way citizens approach this topic. Um, a, we have a lot of illiterate citizens in Europe, including in my own country, the equivalent of a 40%. So I personally do not see how transformation of industry in the next 15, 20 uh, years will be successful when you have such a high percentage of illiterate um, <coughs> members of society. And then you have a certain part of society that is not necessarily the one that is part of the progressive businesses that perhaps are part of Business Europe or other organizations that is indeed not, uh, not, not just about not interested, they don't understand the need why they should reskill. And reskill equals change for them and change equals something scary and bad. Um, and it is a true mindset uh, that we need to, to tackle it. 
in order to move uh, forward. I do hope that the percentages, and we've heard a number of percentages being discussed and, and, and the data we could easily access nowadays, uh, sometimes sounds scary in some societies also to us to read. I do hope they're not so uh, difficult to overcome over the past, the next couple of years, but it will be absolutely crucial that uh, there is a strong leadership on a European level <coughs> and then a national level uh, with the topic uh, to, be, to be tackled. Um, whatever form, and that's a good form. My, my only, um, um, so to say, maybe, maybe worry is a, is a bit too of an exaggerated wording uh, to use, but my only thing is that can we find the finance? Um, yes, to develop a very progressive application, probably yes. If we want that individual learning accounts uh, take a different form, can we? Um, will there be enough uh, support from a governmental uh, perspective? Um, and of course, um, most member states expect the business to do their fair share, and I believe that business does more. Uh, actually than what they're expected to do. But most of the times, indeed, they do reach to the already engaged workforce within their own societies, and we need to reach this other one that's disengaged uh, and not interested and perhaps even being very worried um, about losing the job and not about thinking how they could perhaps do a similar job with a little bit different set of skills. Um, and in this respect, a that uh, you know you could be reskilled. We need the good examples because right now I have colleagues that are um, the, the most strong opponents of reskilling, and uh, they are warning people that this is a bad thing. Um, so if they have their uh, easily attaching uh, sentences and narrative to society that touch the brain but also the heart of society, we need to give these other examples because uh, I believe that uh, there is this silent majority of society that does believe that but it's not too vocal uh, on that part. Thanks, Ivan. Um, so I'd like to close with one round <coughs> of reflection and uh, feel free to you know, raise your hand if you would like to before opening to the audience. Uh, but what I've heard is mainly, we've talked a lot about individual learning accounts, um, a funding mechanism is affordable, it en enables people to have a choice, um, and it enables people to really um, you know, think about training in a different way and really uh, change the culture. Um, but what you've also, also raised is mainly the, the whole topic of information and guidance, and this is, I think, for individuals as well as employers, because some of the small and medium enterprises might not know where you know the, the road is heading as well in terms of digitalization and shared skill needs. And then the point of government uh, funding, employer investment that we, we don't want to crowd out. So my question to you is, um, on the two objectives, inclusive and really setting us up for the future. Um, what would you, what would be your wish or your recommendation uh, to really um, you know, <coughs> enable adult skills systems to move forward? So we have the funding, but is there anything else needed, or is there anything else in the design needed? You look like you want to respond. Please go ahead. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, well. Uh, I would say, in terms of uh, responding to the future challenges, I think we definitely need individual learning accounts, not only, uh, so I would say it is needed, it is needed funding. Uh, we already have a lot of money uh, for vocational training. In France, we have no problem with money, we have no problem with, uh, the, the <laughs> well, sorry. Uh, we only have a lot of uh, money dedicated to vocational training. Uh, we also have many stakeholders, uh, there is also a full set of obligations for employers. But the purpose of uh, the individual learning account is to change the narrative, to develop uh, motivation among employees and, and, and people. Uh, to, 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 to set uh, an effective way to, to, to deliver uh, the trainings. So I, I really trust that we, we need uh, not only vocational 
uh, certain uh, uh, schemes that we need to focus on a number of effective tools. And when it comes to developing inclusive approaches, I would like to emphasize that uh, our new uh, inventory account in France is a part of a bigger policy transformation because we are deeply innovating the governance of uh, the professional training uh, scheme. Mm -hmm. We have uh, mobilized uh, uh, a 15 billion euro plan within five years uh, to invest uh, in skills of uh, uh, low qualified uh, young and, and, and adults and, and, and job seekers. Uh, we are deeply innovating the education uh, schemes uh, to enlarge uh, the, the skills and, and, and to tackle social inequalities. So, of course, uh, uh, we need not only to design an inclusive approach within the IOM, but we need also to put it in a more global uh, inclusive approach. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, th I think from, from my side, um, it would be important to promote social partnership and the capacity of, um, of social partners at the national level to, to design and implement um, uh, training measures together with the governments of education training providers that will address the specific needs that there are at national, regional level within um, different national settings. Um, and yeah, I think, as I said, the, the learning accounts are one way, not the only way. We heard from the recruitment sector about the um, different uh, BIPOC guide initiatives um, that there are in some countries there. So um, I think, you know, we shouldn't put all the eggs in the, the individual learning account basket, but we should recognize that there are um, different ways through collective agreements, training funds, etc., cetera, um, of providing training and, and to really see which is, there's no one best way to do it. And I think especially from the European level, we have to be conscious that we can't be too prescriptive in, in how best to, to address the, the shared need that we can all agree with and identify and I want to support, which is to upskill and reskill um, individuals to the benefit of the individuals and, of course, indeed, the, the companies. Um, yeah, um, I had a list of, uh, let's say, requirements or issues and challenges for such an initiative to uh, take place and be successful. And I wanted, uh, some of those were mentioned, and I just wanted to bring uh, a few of them that I, I think are important to. Uh, maybe repeat, but also mention for the first time, because I, I, I don't think I heard anything related to how this will ensure that personal and professional and professional development are both equally important in these training rights. So I think it's very important because uh, recent research from different international organizations are showing that are not only job-related skills that are important, but also transversal skills. And that's also about the personal development of the individuals. So one of our concerns would be how to ensure that we have a balance uh, between personal and professional development. The other issue is how do we ensure that the burden is not on the individual, which means that public and private partnership, as you said, is key in this regard but the public responsibility should remain the main one to especially help those most in need. Uh, so this is very important uh, point. Of course, something that was mentioned in your paper, uh, but it didn't necessarily go beyond it, maybe my European, uh, let's say, um, spirit has something in, even more ambitious to that. We spoke about portability from one employer to another, from one job to another. What about portability from one European country to another? I think this is something that we should also keep it in our minds, uh, as I think it's an extension of the Erasmus uh, students' mobility, and it was a great uh, flagship uh, initiative that created Europe, from my perspective. 
Uh, and I think it's very important that if this would, uh, we would promote and um, initiate this um, individual learning accounts, the portability across Europe should be important in my opinion. Uh, and last but not least, it was mentioned of course, but I would highlight it even more, the recognition here is key. Uh, we mentioned uh, low uh, skills. In the digital context, it's, more, it's not really just for low skill. We are talking about low qualified people that are dependent on a particular employer because they have been working there for 20 years, but they have no qualifications for it. So how they can move from one job to another <coughs> if they have no qualifications to kind of uh, show the, uh, the prove the, the competences that they have. So I think it, it's an extra layer to the recognition and quality certification. Um, I just wanted to say one last uh, thing um, as a reaction also to what Eva mentioned. In Europe, we have to be also aware of the fact that big companies, of course, have the capacities. They have been doing this for many years. So this is not new to them, and we are not convincing them of anything. But uh, small, medium enterprises, which is the majority of our labor market, that's an issue. They don't have time to spend and invest on their employees' training. So how do we support them in doing so? This is the question that we should be reflecting. Thank you. Um, just a few points uh, to add, but I'll pick uh, where Britenna uh, left on, on SMEs. Um, actually, five years ago, um, the Juncker Commission launched the so-called Juncker Fund, the European Fund for Strategic Investments. Um, and at its review, together with Vice President Katainen and a few other supporters of uh, upskilling our professionals, we actually made it possible that this funding could also be uh, allocated for, um, for um, trainings. Um, and it's something that is less known, uh, and I think it should be better known. Of course, the first part of, of the funding that uh, companies uh, could, could get was uh, more on uh, internet, but it's a way of uh, changing again the mindset. Why could they use a loan, a good loan taken by the support of the, uh, of the EIB uh, in a different context uh, than now? Um, and then you said if there's anything we wrap up in recommendations, I would just put it again, uh, sitting with experts is difficult, but. Uh, I'll go with my political uh, messaging uh, here. Um, when I spoke about uh, leadership, um, it's not easy to take on board for uh, a political uh, leadership in a member state a topic that would only deliver results in as early as five years, maybe. Sometimes we could maybe look into projects that could deliver results earlier, but those projects related to upskilling, you could feel um, uh, their benefits um, uh, later than the next election. So we need this true leadership that thinks 10 to 15 years ahead that could deliver uh, on these sort of topics. And secondly, I think for some member states, uh, the topic of upskilling is also related uh, to the demographic crisis some member states are, are, are witnessing. And we now have a commissioner, a vice president responsible uh, for democracy, demography. And perhaps it might be of interest that next time she and someone from her team also joins uh, the discussion. Because we are having regions uh, um, totally being depopulated. Or regions where a company might find it attractive to invest. But when the first box is not ticked of the people being there and the uh, skilled people being there, the company uh, decides not to do it. Uh, and this is part of one of the reasons why more and more regions uh, will be uh, depopulated, hence putting more burden on certain member states uh, to bring uh, um, to, to Europe, uh, whether it's funding or, or, or other points. Thank you. Well, thanks uh, for those reflections. I think they're really quite rich. Um, I don't know, um, if we still have a couple of minutes for questions. Yeah, um, can you have one microphone to Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. 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 Thank
budgetary terms for the development of transitions we have now in the France, you are allocating uh, uh, up to 500 euros per year per person uh, with a maximum of uh, 5,000 euros. Now, if, if I'm looking forward to get me in the context, I'm planning for the possibility that somebody might leave that scheme for 10 years. Do I understand correctly? If the maximum budget is 5,000 euros yeah. uh, per yeah. person, uh, but that person could use <laughs> up to 500 euros per year, and if my math, uh, basic math works, uh, that's a 10 year time frame. Yeah. The reason why I'm asking is because, yeah. let's be realistic, uh, if no matter how much training you take, in 10 years uh, you don't transition from one job to the other, uh, you're basically unemployable. So I'd like to understand a bit more the logic behind uh, those numbers, if I understood them correctly. I think you did. The, the maximum amount of your right will be 5,000 euro or 8,000 euro if you belong to a disadvantaged group, you see. Um, and it should be higher, you see. So this budget is the, sh the share in all the expenditure dedicated to vocational training in the country that is mobilized through the individual earning account. But currently, for the first year, uh, according to our plans, this will represent one <coughs> euro out of nine. This share should be higher in the upcoming years, but this share should never represent the whole share. So this individual learning account will never represent the total amount or the total actions uh, devoted to vocational training, uh, whatever the source of it, you see? But we, we consider it as a size is the uh, incentive. Yes, so I also have a question to Mr. Sandini on the uh, I'm very curious in how you manage this tension between on the one hand empowering individuals, but on the other hand giving the role to employers in the choice of training. So um, maybe looking back at your experience since 2015, so if I'm not mistaken, in the beginning also there was de facto a very strong role for employers in requesting training. So what I'm wondering is, could it be that um, somebody uses these new tools, looks in the app, finds an interesting training, and wants to spend his or her money on that, but then de facto there's this conflict with the employer who thinks the budget should spend, be spent on something else. Uh, is that something that uh, uh, this kind of conflict on, on, on who de facto takes the initiative uh, uh, that, that maybe certainly you've been thinking about, and maybe that's something that you also addressed in the redesign of the system, or I was curious in your reflection on this type of uh, uh, challenge. I, I think I can respond a little bit. Um, it's a right, and it's there is always a possibility if you have your right to mobilize it, I mean, to, to purchase a training. but. The employer can never force an employee, somebody having this right, to mobilize this right depending on uh, uh, a plan at, at, at an enterprise level uh, first. A second element is that the, the, the law passed uh, in 2018 has not fundamentally changed uh, the obligations on the employer side. I mean, uh, we have been already taking there a number of uh, provisions, but uh, the obligations related to vocational training on employers are still there, and they have been technically redesigned so that they become more effective. And the third uh, element of answer <coughs> is that, as I already said, this individual learning account <coughs> is something specific, but very likely not to be enough so that we open a space for discussion and collaboration between uh, employees and employers, so that hopefully, thanks to win-win uh, plans, they manage to, to get more for each uh, part's benefits. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for Mr. My question is around recruitment um, practices, because we talk about skilling, upskilling, reskilling, 
um, and we talk about the beyond the competence and concept to that. When an HR manager receives an application, they tend to read it in a more traditional sense. They look at how many degrees you have, how many years on the job, if you have a fragmented CV, they might not be interested, anyone coming from the consulting background, the gig economy, etc., will not be recognized for their skills. They will be recognized for years of experience and the number of certificates. So is there anyone here or any of you, is anyone doing any work on addressing the recruitment practices which are already discriminatory and do not fit within this landscape? And my other question comment goes back to the learning accounts. I just want to know, and it's maybe a similar question to what the gentleman asked, how do we um, sort of reconcile a personal preference and a need on a specific job. So say I want to reskill, or I want to move into a new sector and I want to use my learning account to do that, yet I'm stuck on a job. Does that mean taking time off? I mean, how can I reconcile that with my employer and is there a provision for that? Thank you. I would like to just give a very brief comment because I unfortunately uh, have to leave uh, after that. Um, it's something that I wanted to talk, but it wasn't the point of the discussion. However, I want to link it to the recruitment practices. Well, I think it's obvious that these are the recruitment practices, and perhaps 90% of, 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 of the ways people are recruited, professionals are recruited. And I think one of the reasons why this is the case is because the way our educational system uh, functions in most places. Uh, so currently, uh, you are asked to have your diploma, your certificate, it's all about getting this thing and it's all about what grades you have. And the assessment of your many other skills that you might have, it's not there or how you are uh, asked to, to, not asked, but how do you gain those skills. Um, again, the country that I know best and where I've invested heavily uh, in, in education and reforming it, um, it's all about study that by heart and now we've examined on whether you know at the exact date and, and, and so on uh, that's given in the textbook. Uh, and people aim at just getting a good grade and a certificate and a diploma and not uh, <laughs> having an overall assessment of, of your skills. But if someone is working on their recruitment assessments, I'll be curious to know and I think it is a much needed initiative. Uh, Not that I want to open this Pandora box because I think uh, education is maybe at the basis of the issue, but not only. Uh, it's also about the trust uh, in between employers and it's about how, how we move forward also with the recognition issue uh, because that's also the quality assurance again. Ooh, there are many different layers of issues uh, that academia, of course, is blocking um, and is reflecting also <coughs> to the employers. But yeah, in, in my opinion, that's wh where the individual learning accounts come in uh, to breach this, uh, break the silos between education and labor markets in a broader sense and uh, bring together the different stakeholders to speak about the different issues, including the recruitment in, in this regard. because is indeed the main issue. In Belgium, you can see that the, em the employer uh, dictates what should take the time off for training. And this is very um, limiting for employers. So it, it's an issue. And thank you very much to everyone. I have to run to another. Yes, I believe, um, yes. No, please. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Last man standing. <laughs> um, just, just very shortly on the, on the recruitment practices, we're not looking at it directly, I have to say, but I think you're right, of course, that companies do, there's a mindset to look at the, the qualifications, the diplomas, etc. Um, and that's, in, the qualifications are important and what certificates they have are important. It's a guide for, for a company. Um, <coughs> but indeed, companies, they don't necessarily just want to know if you have a degree or a diploma, they want to know what's behind it, what an individual is really able to do, what they've concretely learned through whatever educational training route they take, um, and how they can translate that into a practical working environment. Unfortunately, that's not always clear from a diploma, from a degree certificate, um, and indeed that does relate more to the way that 
the, the system is structured perhaps at the moment, but um, certainly from a practical employer's point of view, then yet the companies do want to know more than just what the certificates are, what the diplomas are, what's behind them, but it's not always easy to know that when you just have a CV in front of you. So um, indeed, perhaps we need to reflect more how to, to help employers and to help individuals um, bring that awareness to the, to the company, to the recruiters. Thanks for raising that. Another really important aspect that goes along with this new world of upskilling and um, that we see. So I'd like to thank my panelists, uh, even though we've been out already. <laughs>